Welcome back, AP! <clears throat> Alright, uh, we didn't go over anything in class today, uh, simply because there was only eight of you, uh, but the big thing is we're going to go over everything leading up to the English Civil War in, uh, right now in this flip, and then we're going to uh, talk about really briefly the countries that you need to know. I'll list them and put them on here really quick for the uh, map quiz tomorrow that we pushed back to tomorrow, and then also your next test is projected to be probably around next Tuesday, all right? But let's keep going. So where we left off with last when we were talking about the English conflict with uh, absolutism, we were talking about James I. And we were talking about the Stuart family and how ruling of England had passed to them due to the death of the Tudors under Elizabeth I, right? And we talked briefly in class the other day on Friday about James's personality, right? James's personality, very, very abrasive, uh, believed that he was a divine right monarch, which we'll bring up in a little bit, uh, very close with this guy, write this down, the Duke of Buckingham. Him, right? The Duke of Buckingham is considered one of his closest advisors, also possibly his lover, we're not really sure, um, <clears throat> but a lot of different things. It's the Duke of Buckingham, though. <clears throat> his personality is also really, really funny, simply because like, when he was inaugurated king, he was supposed to stand up and wave to his people, but they were like, sir, wave to your people, these are your people now, and he's like, I'm tired. And they said, come on, you can do it. He's like, I'd rather show them the arse, A-R-S-E is a very famous quote of his. So... Biggest things about him, though, is that he really just was a very, very abrasive guy. Didn't really, really tolerate anything and also hated a one group in particular with a seething passion, right? So his other big issues were issues with religion, as exemplified through a lot of different religious divides. So James hates Puritans in particular. Really quick, another thing that you can call Puritists, un Puritans, underneath Puritans in parentheses, right? Separatists, right? Separatists. So, they're also considered separatists, but Puritanism was a major trend on the rise. Many parliament meters were, leaders were converting to Puritanism, and a lot of people in England didn't like Puritans simply because of the fact that they actually... Uh, they called to outlaw or banish a lot of different things because they thought that they were a giant distraction from God, which I thought was a little, like, or I still think is a little ridiculous. Um, they didn't like um, loud clothing. They don't believe in people wearing wedding bands because it's a show of too much pride. Uh, they don't really like any colors other than black and white. They don't believe in alcohol. They don't believe in music and singing. They don't believe in um, the theater, all kinds of stuff, right? So... A lot of conflicts are going to come to head with them. Now, he's very surprisingly tolerant of Catholics, though. A lot of this has to do with the fact that he is the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, and a huge Catholic, right? Um, and also, though, he saw, however, he did pass laws to keep the English happy, to try and seek an end to public worship of Catholicism. Really quick, though, rewinding that back again real fast. Why do you think Catholics were really, 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 really excited when he became king? Because they thought they had an ally inside of the royalty now. They thought their monarch was an ally to the Catholics, not an enemy. So one of the craziest events under his reign actually popped up. It was called the Gunpowder Plot. Write down the Gunpowder Plot. Uh, the Gunpowder Plot was an attempted assassination of the king when uh, Guy Fox, which is his name, along with uh, Guy Fox, spelled F-A-U-X, uh, Guy Fox, along with six other conspirators, had planned to put barrels of gunpowder <coughs> underneath Parliament, and when he was addressing Parliament, to blow it up and uh, actually kill James I. And they actually didn't find out about this plot until one of the conspirators, conspirators actually wrote a letter um, explaining that when it would happen and actually like that uh, it was going to be an outlash against the king. And so the king actually stopped the entire thing and caught Guy Fox in particular, and they actually had him hanged and executed, right? Uh, this actually just kind of shows a lot of the uh, rifts. It's the the gunpowder plot is very important because it shows a rift between the people of England and the ruling class, right? Um, but the, actually, they celebrate uh, the 5th of November is, gun, is the gunpowder plot day. And that's when they actually foiled the assassination attempt. They celebrate it, though, every year in England now with torches and parades, and they actually burn eff effigies of uh, Guy Fox over top of these big bonfires and stuff. So, anyway, also one of the most famous things about him, uh, put quotes around no bishop, no king. It's one of his most famous quotes. The main thing about it is a lot of the Puritans called to get rid of the ideas of bishops and the hierarchies in the churches because they thought that was a very Catholic thing, and they wanted to purge all of the Catholic things out of the Anglican church. And so he began to say, you know what? No bishops, 
no king, because he believed that the appointing of bishops within his own church was a monar monarchical right and was something that he deserved to have to try and keep consent between religion, his people, and himself, right? So uh, he actually was pro-bishops, but he used to say, no bishop, no king, as a like, direct rebellion against the Puritans. Now, another big thing about James, this is all kind of under the same things about James Stewart. Uh, he hates Parliament. He absolutely hates Parliament. He doesn't like the idea that he is anything other than a divine right ruler. He and his son, Charles I, who will come up here in a moment, believe that they are divine right rulers who were bestowed the power to rule upon them by God. Okay? Continuing forward, though, he's also going to continually anger the parliament. And a lot of it has to do with uh, going waffling back and forth on Catholic sentiments, uh, going back and forth on certain individuals. Like, he actually had Sir Walter Raleigh executed. The famous... Uh, navigator in the famous beginner of the Roanoke colony in North Carolina, he actually had him uh, uh, actually executed and they uh, chopped his head off. Uh, also, a lot of it has to do with this stuff called like tonnage and poundage and his arranged marriage of his son, which we'll get into in a minute. But next to tonnage and poundage, which is very, very important right here, uh, tonnage and poundage has to do with uh, their taxes on imports and exports. Tonnage is a, ta is a tax on imported casks of wine by the ton, and poundage is actually a tax on exported materials going out. It has to do with their weight, all right? So anyway, but it's ways that the parliament actually continually made money, and um, the uh, James I actually wanted to up tonnage and poundage and to make more money for the crown. Now, he's also going to cause a massive financial crisis, though. So you have to understand something about James I and his son, Charles I, right here. And this is him in his younger days, right before he got married to Henrietta from France, who was a Catholic, uh, she was a Catholic uh, princess. The financial crisis was due to a lot of royal spending. He spent a ridiculous amount of money, ridiculous amount of money on uh, financing help for the Thirty Years' War, uh trying to build up infrastructure, building homes for himself, uh, a lot of different royal expenditures. But just may, just put maybe royal in, like royal expenditures. He also wanted to build up the infrastructure was a big thing as well. So his feuds are going to like crop up mostly with Parliament, though, because Parliament is going to try and stall voting on a lot of things to try and choke him in his wallet, right? So Parliament actually has one famous debate when they refuse to vote on tonnage and poundage and impositions due to the fact that they wanted him to sweat without money for a little while. So, Parliament holds the power of the purse strings, is what it's called. They are the ones who control the tax money, levy taxes, and deem what they are necessary to spend money on. So, a lot of absolute rulers like to spend money on themselves, right? So, one of the biggest things that he did is actually called impositions. So, imposition was a surcharge. You know how like, you get a service fee? Um, when you go on to Ticketmaster, for example, and a lot of y'all have bought uh, concert tickets before, when you go on to Ticketmaster, you don't just pay the cost of the ticket, you pay taxes, fees, and then an online convenience charge. So, and these piss off everybody, right? Nobody likes paying these things. Well, that's what an imposition is. He wanted to try and levy extra fees on uh, different shipments, on imports and exports, and the merchants who carried them on top of tonnage and poundage, which is going to make the people of England rife with anger. Because it's just, they're getting nickel and dime. They're getting nickel and dime all the time. He just wants to keep getting money from them. The only great success of King James is his version of the Bible, right? He actually had translators work for five straight years on creating a vernacular English language version of the Bible. So I'm actually trying to keep time right now to make sure I don't go too, too long. So anyway, however though, enter Charles I, his son. So eventually James is going to die, believing his only great success as starting arguments, like honestly results of the first Stuart reign, arguments with Parliament, tries to raise too much money, makes good Bible, awesome. But the main thing to draw back from this is his huge beef with Parliament over trying to raise finances to try and finance his royal expenditures, right? So anyway... Charles I, ultimate tool bag, right? Well, let's get into him a little bit. So first and foremost, let's talk about his personality. Let's put a star next to this, or underline it, or highlight it. He ruled without Parliament three separate times before ever actually uh, ruling with them. So when he came into power in 1626, I believe, 
Uh, he actually had fired and dissolved parliament and ruled without them several times before. And dissolved means fired. He literally let them go and tried to like collect taxes on his own. Well, the problem with this is the parliament believes that you must rule along with them, right? And this is a premise of the Magna Carta, right? Going back to the Magna Carta in like 1215 AD, and the uh, real, real keystone turning points and markers of British politics has to do with the fact that uh, it's a limited monarchy. The monarch must rule with parliament as a representative body of the people. Now, along with his father, he also believed in the idea of a divine right monarchy. He also pissed off the English out the gate when he married a 15-year-old French Catholic, right? So the big thing about it is like you can't execute the gunpowder plot, people, and then marry your son to a Catholic. You're trying to like please too many people all at once. Also, the Duke of Buckingham, still alive and considered one of his closest advisors, right? He listened to him way too much. So next to like this over here, somewhere beneath the stuff about Duke of Buckingham, write down the fact that, or somewhere to the side, the Duke of Buckingham tried, whenever they didn't have parliament in session, he tried to just tell Charles to send the Navy to go and steal from other countries. He said, oh, there's a, there's a Spanish gold ship coming in from the New World. Let's rob them, right? So like he would actually try to encourage him to impound Spanish vessels and steal all the reserves off of them to try and make more money. And a lot of other different stuff. But when he actually brings Parliament back in 1628, because he needs to so he can help raise money, so he actually he is forced to sign this document. Circle this, star this, underline this. It's crazy important. It is considered the equal to the Magna Carta in terms of limiting the power of a king. The Petition of Right is a document that, forced, that Parliament forced Charles to sign, saying that he was not personally allowed to levy taxes without the Parliament or imprison people without just cause, right? So there was a bunch of different instances where Charles actually had imprisoned people without a right to do so. He imprisoned them because they couldn't pay the tonnage and poundage fees, and he would confiscate their goods and then imprison them like for their debts or whatever, which was extremely illegal, right? So this document, the Petition of Right, just further checked the power of the king, right? So this is a massive important thing. But the idiots in the parliament didn't even think to realize the fact like we should also probably include something that he can't fire us anymore. Well, what do you think Charles is going to do immediately after signing the Petition of Right? That's right. He is going to fire parliament again, right? And so begins his idea of the 11 years of tyranny, right? He ruled without them from 1629 to 1640, and in what was known as his 11 years of tyranny. The people of England grew to hate their king during this time period. As you can tell, I get very hyped up about this because I know a lot about it. Now, anyway, so the big thing about Charles, though, they couldn't stand him. They thought he was a total goon, right? They did not like him. And a lot of it has to do with the fact of how he actually made money. Right? Because I put revenue, question mark. It's like, if you don't have the parliament, you can't levy taxes. You're only making the steady same stream of income that you've been making this entire time. How do you, like, uh, actually raise money? Well, a big one was called ship money, right? So ship money was actually that individual townships and places in England had to pay extra taxes on British naval vessels in their ports to help protect their areas. This is going to make a lot of people irate. Coronation fines was actually really, really funny and really stupid. So he would actually say, oh, to a noble. He'd be like, hey, uh, who's somebody in class? Um, he'd be like, Henry Fom, you're going to be knighted, right? Show up to London and you will be knighted on this day along with Nathan, Nick, Brett, and uh, pfft, Megan Drummond, right? We will knight you on this day. And let's say hypothetically everyone shows up except for Megan, right? Because she didn't get the message. He would fine her for not coming to these knighthoods, and he would also keep it on the hush-hush and, like, sometimes just not even tell people, but then, like, they would get a letter saying, you have been fined for not showing up to your knighthood. Take that, right? So, the coronation fines were extremely stupid. He also granted monopolies to people, so companies would actually pay him for the rights to monopolies. One of the biggest ones was on the soap trade from this one, uh, one family in, uh, the, I think it was in Wales. Um, I need to look that up. But he would grant them monopolies, and they would pay fees to have monopolies on one product. And you've had US1. You know what a monopoly is. It's cornering that market on a certain product, right? Also, debts and promises. He would actually borrow large amounts of money from foreign allies or royal fam or like wealthy families in England. And then he'd be like, look, I'll pay you back later, and I'll pay you an 8% interest. 
but he never actually would do it, right? So he's doing nothing but angering the royal families as well as uh, the common people of England. Now, one of the other big things that's going to happen, though, this needs a header. It's called the Book of Common Prayer and Long Parliament, right? Well, everything's going to hit the fan during the 11 years of tyranny whenever his archbishop is actually going to try and force the Book of Common Prayer on the Scottish Presbyterians. Now, we didn't talk a lot about the Presbyterians, but they're a type of Calvinist, right? Right next to them, just like type of Calvinist. They're a type of Scottish Calvinist. They do not believe in the ideas of the church hierarchy. They do not believe in the ideas of common prayer. They do not believe in the ideas of the Eucharist, and they do not believe in a lot of different things like that, right? So the idea that you're forcing onto them the Book of Common Prayer, and also there was a thing about an altar piece. He said that all the, the Presbyterians had to have a wooden altar, which they thought was like too Catholic-y, and so they freaked out, and they had a rebellion. So due to this rebellion, though, Charles has to bring Parliament back to fight off the Scots, because remember, to fight a war, you need money, right? Coming in 15 minutes, this is good stuff, I'm, at, I'm going, I'm going. So, he had to bring Parliament back to try and fight off the Scots, right? So, the biggest thing about it is, though, when he is, at, when they call Parliament back, it lasts for 20 years, okay? So, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, 20 years, right? So, the Triennial Act is going to be one of the things that they pass. So remember, the Petition of Right was awesome. Can't levy taxes without us. Can't imprison anybody without just cause. But they are now going to pass an idea that Parliament has to convene every three years. So even if he wants to fire them, can't really do anything about it because every three years they must come back into session. Some of you are like, what does come back into session mean? What is all this stuff? I don't understand what's going on. Well, the thing about Parliament is they have breaks, right? They have breaks. It's called when they return and when they rise, right? When they rise means when they get up and they leave the parliament, as in they are going away and taking a break, right? So I just, the parliament has risen, and now the parliament has returned, right? So, well, the thing about it is they're not, like, Charles would not, like, when he would dissolve them, he would block them from returning, right? So, he, they passed the Triennial Act, though, making it every three years they had to come in. Well, what else is going to happen, though, is a new rebellion is going to rise up in Ireland due to a lot of anti-Catholic views in England. Uh, all the Catholics in Ireland, so you can put a Catholic rebellion in Ireland, Catholic rebellion rose up in Ireland, um, and Charles had no power to stop both the Scottish um, rebellion and the Irish one at the same time, right? So then the rumors begin to circulate. The poor, helpless King Charles has no power to protect the people within his own empire, and then he hears the word on the street is that five members of parliament are aiding the Scottish rebels. The ish just hit the fan, right? Like, so he freaks out. He's livid. He's so angry. So what he decides to do is he is going to walk into the parliament building and arrest those five members Funny enough, though, they heard that he was coming. They escaped out a back door and got into a little boat and then paddled away, right? And so apparently when he was in there, he's like, my birds have flown, right? So it's some of the stupidest things on the planet. But now he's extremely embarrassed, right? He has just tried to uh, actually imprison these guys, probably execute them, which would he actually would turn them into martyrs, which is actually hilarious in the long run. But here we go. Humiliated, Charles fled to northern England, and he rose an army to fight the Parliament army that had just risen in London, right? So, the Parliament has writ brought up an army to try and protect those five guys that actually evaded the, uh, his, um, his arrest, right? Charles brings up his own army. We now are about to hit it, and so began the English Civil War. A humiliated monarch against his own legislative branch, right? Absolutely hilarious. Uh, I love this story. I think it's so intense, right? There's so many characters and layers to it. Um, really, really quickly, listen up, though. I'm going to tell you exactly the countries that you need to know uh, for the map quiz tomorrow. You need to know, write these down, uh, somewhere separate in like a little word bank area. You need to know England, the HRE, Austria, Poland, Lithuania, Spain, Portugal, France, Ireland, and the Ottoman, all right? That's really it. You're going to be do it filling out a political map of these places on a map of Europe to just try and show you the disambiguation and also just the chaos of this entire era because the main thing about it is that you need to know from a map standpoint is that basically with absolutism, it's like 
a mom has just dropped a pie for dessert and all of the siblings are bickering over how big their slice is, right? So, but those are the ones you need to know. So play those back and write those down. And uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow. So that's the English Civil War lead up. We'll talk more about the English Civil War itself tomorrow. See y'all then, AP.